Hello, my name is Pastor Joel Silverman. Thank you for watching the Regeneration Church broadcast. It's my hope that through this message, you are encouraged and made stronger in Jesus Christ and the truth of his word. Enjoy this message and may God richly bless you. Father, we just thank you that the joy of the Lord is our strength and God, it, it's like medicine to our soul. And so we just thank you for these few moments of uh, joy and laughter. But now, Lord, we ask that you would open our hearts and our, our eyes and our ears for the word of God, that Lord, you would give me the gift to communicate so that everyone would understand the word of God. Therefore, the enemy could not take it from us. We know that if you sow the seed of the kingdom and it's not understood, the Bible says, said immediately the wicked one takes the word out of our heart. Lord, we guard our hearts this morning. Out of our hearts flow the issue of life. And so I thank you for watching over your word. I thank you. Your word is anointed. And I thank you that it's going to be planted in good soil and it's going to produce a harvest. And I just pray for liberty, Father. Help me to just be relaxed. I'm at home with family. And so I thank you for the word of God this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'm going to be teaching a, a message this morning titled The Pearl of Great Price. And I was quite blessed uh, when I travel as much as I do and have as many sermons as, as I have. I never know what's the right word for the right group at the right time. And so I'm really seeking God. And I had two sermons for this morning. And one was The Pearl of Great Price. And another was the, one of the names of God that we looked at this weekend. And I'm standing in the foyer yesterday and Margaret goes, Jesus died for the Pearl of Great Price. Out of nowhere. I mean, who talks about this? And I thought, okay, Lord, I know that I have the right word. So it's a very short portion. It's found in Matthew chapter 13. I want to read two verses, and then I'd like to share six things with you this morning about a pearl, the pearl of great price. Matthew 13, 45 and 46. It said, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he found just one pearl of great price, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Now, it's rare that I teach on just a small portion like this, but the Lord began to speak to me and he wanted me to study and find out how pearls were made. What is What does it take to actually get a pearl? And uh, so there's several things I want to talk to you about. The first is this, a pearl pearl is a product of suffering. Now, what happens is an oyster gets a little bit of sand or irritant under the shell, and it's so annoyed and irritated that it's suffering like this that it starts to secrete um, saliva and calcium. And the more irritated it gets, the more aggravated this little animal is, the more it secretes to make even a better pearl. Now, we'd all like to be pearls a great price, but we don't want to suffer. Uh, I don't like it when I have to suffer. You don't like it when you have to suffer. And every Every single one of us has at least one irritant in our life. One person that just knows how to push our buttons and irritates us no matter what we do. And so we try to get rid of the irritation. But really, God's working something in us. The more the pearl, the more the oyster is irritated, the more it's agitated, the more it's aggravated, um, the more something of beauty comes out of that. And so you have to realize that if we're going to be the pearl of great price and Jesus is the merchantman, then we need to go through some things to make us beautiful and to give us luster and endurance. And so I have one verse and then I want to talk to you for a little bit about suffering. Uh, not too long because it's not my favorite topic. First Peter 4, 12 and 13. I wanted to read that. First Peter 4, 12 and 13. Uh, point one, a pearl is a product of suffering. Verse 13, 1 Peter 4. But rejoice in so much as you are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory is revealed, you will be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you, for the spirit of glory and the spirit of God rest upon you. So, I'm sorry, I missed verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trials which are to try or test you as though some strange thing is happening to you. Do you know all of us are being tried and tested? And it actually talks about through the suffering we're being tested 
and hopefully conform to the image of God's dear son. Most of us would do anything to avoid a suffering. Um, we want to walk away from it. We want to ignore it. We want to get a shortcut through it. But the way to really become a product of beauty and something God can use, we have got to go through the tests in our life. And I began to think about the testing periods. Um, and I want to just share four things that have blessed my life that I wish someone had told me many, many, many years ago when I was a much younger woman and a new Christian. No one told me these things. Here's what I want to share with you about the time of testing or the time of trial, suffering. Number one, every test is timed. For some reason, when it comes to spiritual things, we think it's never going to end. Anybody ever been in a test beside me and you just think, dear God, Lord Almighty, will this ever come to an end? God's got everything under control. He knows the beginning from the end. Matter of fact, he planned the end before he started the beginning. And so when we go through a test, when we're in the test, it feels hopeless sometimes, like it'll never end. But God's in control. The test is timed and it will come to an end. I don't know now uh, what kids do in school, but when I was in school, if we were going to be given a 45-minute test, that was it. I mean, it started at 10 and it stopped at 10.45 and that's all there was to it. We knew the beginning and we knew eventually it had an end. Please remember that in your testings with God, that he's got an end. The second thing I learned about testing, and this is very, very hard for women, and men, you are not allowed to elbow your wife. But uh, the second thing is there should not be a lot of talking during the testing period. Thank you. Now, how many of you know that women process our problems by speaking about it and talking and talking and talking? I sound like a New Yorker. Women just talk way too much. Now, you know men. I don't have to tell you who you are. You know where your cave is. When my husband has a problem, he wants to be left alone. He doesn't want to talk about it. He wants to go in his place. He wants to figure it all out. And he wants to come out and fix me. Can I get an amen from the men? And so my husband, is, he wants everything resolved. And he wants me to get, let me just say, let me help the women here that are married who would like to stay married. Um, <laughs> men don't want the details. They could care less. If I go out to a store, Macy's, and I see Mary in the pocketbook department, and I go home and say to my husband, oh, I went to Macy's on the second floor today. I parked by the handicap parking because there was a light, and I went up on the escalator, and I went to look at the pocketbooks, and I happened to see my friend Sally, and she had on the nicest Gucci coat, and I loved her boots. My husband would be livid. Here's what I would tell that to Carol, but if I saw my husband, I'd say, oh, I saw Sally. <laughs> I wouldn't even bother with the Macy's or the pocketbooks or the clothes or the escalator. Men want you to get to the bottom line. Women start at the finish. If Really. Now, if they're willing to hear some of the details, help yourself. But I have learned after being married 48 years, my husband is not into the details. He wants to be left alone when he's in a test. He wants to be I wants me to be quiet so he can process how to fix the world. And all the men said, Amen. Amen. <laughs> so number two, no talking. Now, that doesn't mean you can't share a prayer request with a friend. But women tell the same problem to different women on a daily basis. Do we not? And no one can solve our problem but God. However, we love to tell it. And what happens in a time of testing is the more you tell it, now I might be the only sinner in the house, but the more you tell it, the more embellished it gets. My son said to me, Mom, that's the book of Elastic. He said, you stop preaching the Bible and you're preaching out of the book of Elastics. He goes, that's a stretch. That's a stretch. So I've had to gear it back, try to stay focused, focused because women have a tendency to embellish. It just doesn't it get bigger and better every time you tell it. And uh, sometimes we're hurting ourselves by doing that. So during testing periods, the test is timed. Number two, there shouldn't be a lot of talking during the testing. And number three, you can't cheat your way through this test. You might have been able to get away with it in school. I was the world's worst cheat. You know, I haven't always been saved. Hallelujah. And I remember remember uh, when I was trying to learn my time tables, I bought masking, not masking tape, medical tape. You know the tape that comes in a metal circle? Because it sticks to the back of people's clothing. So I wrote all my time tables except the two. I could handle the two time tables. And all the people in front of me, I stuck the masking 
masking tape. And, and I just said, no problem during the test because there were all my answers. Well, let me tell you a true story about cheating that hurt me. I got away with that one. The next one I didn't get away with. I'm a senior in high school and they tell me I have to take my SATs. And I said, why? I'm going to go get a man. I intend to husband hunt and get married as soon as I graduate. So if I'm going to get married and I'm not going to go to college, why do I have to take the SATs? And they said, it's a state law. You must take your SATs. Well, they put us in an auditorium that was on a slant. Bad move, bad move, because that meant I could see all the answers down below me, and there happened to be five young men in the row in front of me. Now, I didn't cheat until I needed to. When I got to the mechanical arts, I was totally lost, so I looked down, and I took one from column A, and I took one from column B, and I just filled in all the blocks. Well, they send it away to the state of New Jersey, that's where I'm from, and it takes a while, and I don't know, six weeks, a couple months later, the guidance counselor calls my father, and they want to set up an appointment with my mom, my dad, and me. Now, I knew I was in trouble, but I had a lot of pokers in the fire, so I wasn't giving away anything. I thought, let the chips fall, and I'll find out what I'm caught on. So I get in the back of the car. I don't say a word. We drive to the high school. There's the principal, the vice principal, the guidance counselor, my mother, my father, and me. And they all shake hands, you know, all the formality of it all. Finally, we're sitting there, and the guidance counselor says to my father, or the vice president, you know, George, may I call you George? He said, yes, you may. He said, George, in all my years in education, we've never had a girl as gifted as your daughter in mechanical arts. I scored a perfect score. And they called me to talk about a scholarship to be an architect. And I just started bawling. No, no, I can't go to college. I don't even know my time tables. I can't be an architect. And so I realized that day <laughs> that cheating doesn't profit anybody. Now, you know, the, we'll tell our kids that, but how many of you know the purpose of a test really is to just show you where you're strong and where you're weak so you can improve? The fourth thing, number one, uh, every test is timed. Number two, minimal talking, please. Uh, number three, uh, there's no cheating, but number four is my favorite of them all. You can get any answer when the test is over. Isn't that marvelous? Do you understand that once the papers are collected, you can go to your professor and say, what was 35A or what was page four? And it's the same with God. Haven't you found that when you need to hear him the most, at least this is my experience, when I'm in a hard testing period, it seems to me the heavens are closed. I, I don't hear anything. Maybe because I'm too self-absorbed with my pain or my challenge. But I have found that when it's over, and I think I could get some testimonies this morning, when it's all said and done and you look back, boy, can you see the hand of God in every single thing you went through, but during the testing, you can't get the answers. There's no answer given till the test is over. So remember that a pearl is made out of a test, or we are made out of testings and trials. Um, I'm going to move to second point two in a minute, but I have to mention this. You know, you know the story of Hannah. Many of you, probably Mother's Day, everybody's heard Hannah. She was brokenhearted because she couldn't have children and her husband married another woman. Why a man would want two mother-in-laws is just beyond me. But he marries a woman named Penina, and Penina starts to irritate Hannah. If you've ever read 1 Samuel chapter 1, Penina irritated Hannah so bad that Hannah was crying and couldn't eat. Now let me just say this. I've lost my cell phone. I've lost my purse. I've lost my coat. I've never lost my appetite. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is to not be able to eat. But she was crying. She couldn't even eat. And Panina, verse 6 of 1 Samuel 1, said her rival provoked her sore. Now, you know what's interesting about this? The name Panina is pearl. means a pearl. And she certainly was an irritant to Hannah. And the name Hannah means grace. And what God said to me is, if you want to be a woman of grace or a man of integrity, you're going to have to have an irritant come alongside you because we all need work. We all need fine tuning. There's, there's edges on all of us. And only an irritation is going to get us to deal with that because we don't want to change. I mean, if I can be perfectly honest, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And so God brings this panina and she just starts. Number two. Number one, a pearl is a product of suffering. Number two, and this is, I love this point. A pearl is made from waste and junk material. 
a pearl is made from waste. All of a sudden, a dead fish's bone, a small piece of bone will get under the shell or a piece of uh, a twig or something, something not usable, something wasted is what makes the pearl. And I got thinking about all the people in the Bible who God used and they became pearls at a great price, but boy, were they a waste in the beginning of their lives, wasted material. And so I'm just going to share for maybe five minutes. I love this. So if I get longer, uh, just, you don't have a hook, do you? Okay, good. Um, I just want to take a few minutes. So that when you leave this service this morning, you'll know that no matter what you've done, or where you've been, or how short you've fallen, that God still can redeem you and use you like you could never imagine. Never imagine. So let's start with Moses. Uh, Moses kills a man with his bare hands. And of course, we're so detense, desensitized now with vi videos and TV and games. You just go and they tap out. It takes a lot to kill a man with your bare hands takes a lot of rage and a lot of anger. And he's defending his nation because a Hebrew was beaten, a, a Egyptian was beaten up a Hebrew. So he kills the man with his bare hands. He buries his body in the sand, right? I want to sit in there. I was going to say it was not a pyramid. I'm sorry. Anyway, he buries the guy's body in the sand. And God, he has an encounter with God. And God takes Moses to the mountain, the murderer Moses, takes him to the mountain and says to Moses, I'd like you to write this as I dictate to you. Thou shalt not, anybody want to help me here? Kill. Can you imagine how Moses felt writing thou shalt not kill? Whoops. Been there, done that, didn't get a t-shirt, but I'm a murderer. I killed somebody. So here's our great deliverer, his history in the beginning is he's a murderer. Then we move to his wonderful brother, Aaron. Now, Aaron uh, is Moses' older brother. And while Moses is up in the mountain writing, thou shalt not kill, all the people come to Aaron in the, in, down below and say, listen, you got to make us a golden calf. We have to have something to worship. We've been 400 years in Egypt, and we've worshipped all these idols and all these statues. We need something visible that we can worship. Make us a golden calf. So in Exodus 32, verse 4, Aaron says, bring all your golden earrings. Verse 4 said he put the gold into a pot, a crucible. He melted the gold. He fashioned and formed a calf. So now they're all drinking and dancing and partying and, and they're worshiping this golden calf. And Moses comes down and he sees this and he said, Aaron, what have you done? And I happen to love verse 24. Listen, verse four is where he forms it, shapes it and fashions it. Exodus 32. But verse 24 is a classic. Moses comes down and said, Aaron, what have you done? He said, I don't know. I put gold in the pot and up jumped a calf. Uh. Really? <laughs> That's what he said. I put gold in the pot and up jumped a calf. So our brother Aaron, who became a priest in the line of the lineage of Levi, our first high priest Aaron was an, was an um, idolater, right? We have a murderer. We have an idolater. Let's not forget their sister Miriam. Let's give equal rights. So Miriam, their sister, uh, in Numbers 5, doesn't like her sister-in-law, and she's jealous of God speaking to her brother. And so she, out of her jealousy and envy, gets smitten with leprosy. And do you know Micah 6, 4 said, I set before you in leadership Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. And I think all three of them struck out, don't you? And I'm glad I might have struck out, but I'm still in the game. Are you with me? I'm still in the game. So we have Moses the murderer, Aaron the idolater, Miriam who's jealous. Let's talk about Noah. Noah was a drunk. He needed triple A. Or no, double A. What is it they go to? Wait, somebody help me here. AA. I, that was an honest slip. He needed AA. I mean, the guy was a drunk. And yet the Bible talks about Noah being a righteous man. Noah the drunk. Then we have Lot. Now, there's no children. They all went to children's church, so I'm free to be a little bit, uh, I can be more mature. But Lot, after Sodom and Gomorrah was burned to the ground in Genesis 19, Lot and his two daughters escape. And they get Lot so drunk that he has sex with his daughter and he doesn't even know he did this. Man, that is drunk. So she has her dad the first night, incest, and the younger daughter says, well, it's my turn. So they get him drunk the second night and she goes in and sleeps with her father and both daughters get pregnant. 
When I teach young people, I warn them, one encounter can do it. Don't think you have to be sexually active for months to get pregnant. These girls slept with their dad one time, and they both got pregnant. And if you know the story, they birthed two of the worst enemies of Israel that ever were born, Moab and Ammon, the Moabites and the Ammonites. But could you imagine having sex with your daughters, and you're the, you're the grandfather and the father at the same time? And doesn't the New Testament talk about Lot being vexed, his righteous soul? So when he got so drunk, he impregnated, or is that a word, impregnated? He, yeah, he got both his daughters pregnant. That's our boy Lot. Then we have Jacob. Liar, liar, pants on fire. Jacob is a downright liar, and he deceives his brother. He deceives his father. I mean, the dude was bad. Uh, the name Jacob means deceiver, trickster, uh, and that's exactly what he was. He dresses in his brother's clothes, and he goes into the old dying man and said, Dad, I'm your firstborn Esau. Ridiculous. Had to run for his life. And so you remember the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob? Jacob did not have a good beginning. Now, you know what happened. Jacob married two women. So I'll bring Leah into this. Leah was not attractive. She might have been an ugly woman. And I've met some ugly women in my life. Oh, I have. I've met some ugly babies. And when that happens, you don't know what to do. When you have an ugly woman or an ugly man, you compliment something about, oh, you have beautiful hair. But when you look in the car, in the carriage of an ugly baby, you just do oh, oh, whoa, what a blessing. You just don't know what to say or do. Uh, anyway, so I think, I think that Leah, because the Bible describes her as not attractive, it says something was wrong with her eyes. I hope they were weren't crossed. You know, I knew this teacher that was cross-eyed and they fired her because she couldn't control her pupils. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Joseph. Um, Joseph had a really hard childhood, hated by his brothers, sold into slavery, um, ended up in prison. I mean, the guy's got a record. And yet, God used Joseph. You know, I'll tell you something funny. Um, years back, I was teaching a Bible study, and I was saying something about Joseph. And I said, how many of you have been in prison? And hands went up all over the church. And I thought, you know, that's a question you need to delete from your resume. I'm not going to even ask. Uh, and so Joseph was in prison. I know, you know, Gideon was filled with fear and hiding. God can use afraid people, can he? He can use drunks. He can use, oh, my God. Where would we be if we had to be perfect and pure and clean? We can't do it. We needed a savior. And I'm just awfully glad that God uses waste material, aren't you? The Moses, the Aaron, the Miriam, the Joshua, the Josephs. So then we get to um, Samson. He was a womanizer. Rahab was a prostitute. Jeremiah and Timothy were told they were too young for ministry. Abraham was told he was too old. Elijah was depressed and suicidal. Job went bankrupt. How am I doing, y'all? Um, after Job, we have Jonah, who ran from God. Mary Magdalene had seven devils. Peter denied the Lord three times. But to me, the worst of all this, as I read through these people, is the one time that Jesus asked for prayer. Now, if I'm wrong on this, please correct me or come and see me. But in my understanding of the New Testament, I see Jesus praying for multitudes. Luke 4, 40 said he prayed from the time the sun came up till the sun went down, prayed for every person, laid hands on every person. I don't know of any time Jesus ever asked anyone to intercede for him except the Garden of Gethsemane. And he said, I am in agony. And he turned to his disciples that he'd poured his life into for three years. And he said, would you please watch and pray with me? I'm in the greatest battle I've ever faced as the son of man. And I need prayer and intercession. Do you know what the disciples did? They fell asleep. Not once, but twice. And it, make, it, it, it affects my emotions when I tell that story because I don't want to fall asleep on the Lord. And I thought, my God, you still use them to change the whole world. And yet the time you needed them the most, they, they went to sleep. And then after the disciples fell asleep, obviously Martha was a worry wart. The Samaritan woman uh, had at least five husbands we know of. Paul absolutely needed anger management. 
There's no question he was a maniac, a madman. Paul, and so Zacchaeus was too short and Lazarus was a dead man. So my word this morning is if God can use these people, don't you dare think he can't use you. Don't you listen one minute to the lie of the enemy because of this or that in your past, God can't use you. He recently said something to me that's very precious. He said, Gwen, I was having some challenges with my daughter. She is now in therapy and it's probably my fault. And uh, so my adult daughter is in therapy and she sent me a text that she doesn't want to speak to me. And that was very hurtful and painful. And um, she said, I'll tell you when I'm ready to talk to you. She said, but I have too many issues from my childhood. And so I don't know why I'm telling you this. There's a reason. Holy Spirit, bring it back to my memory. Wait a minute. Oh, I know what it was. So I was hurt that I messed up her childhood and, and she's got all these issues to deal with. But everybody has issues. How many of you know? God was the perfect parent and both his kids messed up. Right? It took me off the hook. God was the perfect parent and both of them disobeyed. Yes? So it isn't always 100% the parents. But I'm going to take some credit for this, that I, I didn't do the best I could have for her. But anyway, she's in therapy, and now she's not speaking to me. And she'll text me when she's ready to talk to me. And I was crying about it and praying, and this is what God said to me. He said, you can't get a do-over, but I can give you a makeover. And I'm holding on to that, that we're going to have a makeover, my daughter and I, not just, I can't go back and do it over. But thank God he uses us, even with our sin and our weakness. So Matthew 9, here's the verse I have for point two. A pearl is formed out of wasted material. Matthew 9, 12 and 13. On hearing this, Jesus said, it's not the healthy that need a doctor, but the sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Aren't you glad this morning that God called you right where you were and now has anointed you and used you and you are not what you were and you are not what you're yet to be. Um, I'm so thankful to God. I really am. I don't want to talk a lot about this, but I was an out of control alcoholic. I mean, drunk for three, four days at a time, lost weekends. And I remember, I guess I'm supposed to tell this is not something I'm proud of, but um, this was before I was saved. And I remember one night I woke up and there was a uh, throw up all over the bed and all over the floor. And my husband said, I saved your life last night. He said, you were so drunk that you were throwing up on your back. And I was worried you were going to aspirate. Is that the word? Which will kill you. If that goes in your lungs, you die. And he said, I grabbed you by the head and I rolled you over and I threw up all over the floor. And he said, I'm not cleaning up for you one more time. You take care of it. And I, I have, I could tell you a lot of things that I, I'm not proud of, but I'm going to tell you this. God saved me in April, 1974. And I haven't had a drink since that day. The only thing I'm drunk on is the Holy ghost. And I, I know how to get filled and drunk, but the enemy would love to say, but you, you're, you're not intelligent. You were drunk. You were this, you were that. That's all. We're, that's who we were. That's not who I am. Paul said I was a blasphemer, right? I was injurious, but that was in, in ignorance. Now I know Christ. So remember, he's looking for sick. Anybody sick here? I am here. I got sickness right here. I got some dis-ease in my life. And Jesus is coming to heal us. The third thing, a, a pearl grows very, very slowly. As a matter of fact, what research I could find, to make a pearl just the size of a small pierced earring, I don't have any pearls or I would have demonstrated, but it was so small you wouldn't be able to see it. The tiniest, minutest little cultured pearl that women wear for earrings takes a minimum three years. A minimum three years. So you can imagine for the larger pearls, it takes a long time to grow. And we're in a hurry too much. And God's saying, slow down. I've got everything under control. We need to know that it's a long process to be transformed into the image of Christ. And God's going to work with us every day of our life. And our problem is we live in a society where everything is instant and fast. We do nothing. If you had told my mother I could sit in my car, do you have Popeye's chicken here in New York? Yeah. Ooh, I'm glad. But if I told my mother that I could sit in my car and in a matter of two minutes have homemade mashed potatoes with gravy, coleslaw, chicken. I hope you're not hungry. We do have bagels downstairs. Stay with me. But it, 
But if I told my mom that I never had to get out of the car in a matter of two minutes and I didn't even use any cash, I just gave them a piece of plastic and took home a whole cooked meal, do you know how shocked my mother would be? Just one generation removed? She was still peeling potatoes in the field when she was a young girl. They had a pump of water. And so in the, salt, in the um, culture we're in, everything is instant, instant oatmeal, instant coffee. You're not moving God like that. He's got all the time in the world. His other name is, you ready, Ancient of Days. And so I realized that if I want to be a pearl of great price, it might take a whole lifetime. And God's just dealing with me and helping me to grow, but it takes a long time to make something of beauty that's going to endure and last. I've seen flash in the pan, people come and people go. I'm here for the longevity. I want to have more integrity at the end of my life than I have at the beginning. And so I'm on a lifetime mission. I'm not looking for a quick fix. So a pearl takes a long time. The bigger the pearl, the longer the time. And the verse I have for that is um, that it grows very slowly. Philippians 2.13, it's God that works in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. It takes time. Abraham waited 25 years for Isaac. Isaac. Caleb waited 40 years to get his mountain, did he not? He said, I'm as strong, and I'm believing this one. He said, I I'm not 80 yet, by the way, don't age me. But he said, I'm as strong at 80 as I was at 40. Give me my mountain. And I intend to be as strong at 80 as I was at 40. But he waited 40 years to receive his promise, and it wasn't even his fault. How many of you know it was the negative spies that doubted God that caused Caleb, a man of faith, and Joshua, a man of faith, to walk in a desert for 40 years and it wasn't even something they did? Give God time. Amen. Give him time. Don't be in a hurry. You want something that's going to last, it's going to take some time. Everything nowadays is, to, is to, um, throw away and disposable and, you know, it, it's just we need to give God time. One testimony and then I'm going to begin my first landing. Um, God told me in 1982 I would go to India. And so I waited all through the 80s. 82, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Now it's the 90s. 91, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 2000. 2001, 2, 3, 4. Well, now I'm, I'm starting to get an attitude. You know, I've waited long enough here. I mean, I'm going to outdo Abraham, God, if you don't get moving here. You told me in 82 I'd go to India. Here it is, 19, uh, 2005, and I haven't been to India yet. And uh, I was really mad at God that he was making me wait so long. And so I went to a conference. I have to tell you what happened. I went to a conference, and everywhere I went in those days, people would prophesy that I was called to the nations. And I've been now. I'm doing that. But back then, I hadn't, I hadn't been out of the nation. And everywhere I went, the head intercessor had to give me a word, thus saith the Lord, called to the nations. Well, I started to despise prophecy because I didn't want to hear it one more time. I, I've barely been out of New Jersey. Just stop the madness, you know? So I'm at this conference, and there's hundreds of people, and the head intercessor, here she comes, and I know what she's going to say. You know, thus saith the Lord, you're called to the nations. And I thought, I'm going to spit on your shoe if you tell me that. So she walks over, and before she can prophesy, I hear the word nations, and I cop an attitude, and the piano player is on a stool. She spins around and points at me and says, believe God's prophets or you will never prosper, and down I go. And they're all praying over me, and I'm on the rug. I told the women, I suck rug. I don't get slain like a lady. I collapse, I snot, I cry, I suck rug. So there I am, <laughs> on my face. So all of a sudden, I hear the Lord. And what the Lord said to me that day is, you've mentally agreed that I gave you the word to send you to India, but you never believed it in your heart that you were worthy to go. And all those years, 23 plus years, I thought I was in faith. I thought I was believing God. I thought my head and heart agreed, but it never did. When that word came, believe God's prophets or you're not going to prosper, I realized I only believed in my head. I didn't ever think in my heart God could use someone like me to affect a nation. I got up off that floor. I repented of unbelief. I got home from the conference, and in the mailbox was the invitation to India that day. Now, nobody's going to tell me that was a coincidence, not after 23 years. And so I'm telling God, you know, I'm not getting any younger and look how old I am. And so he gives me just for those that might need it. Psalm 35 verse 9 says, your age is of no concern to me. So then I laughed and cried and I said, okay, I'll go wherever you send me. But you know what? It's a slow work. 
Number four, number four, it's a hidden work. Nobody sees it. If you were to scuba dive or, or you know, snorkel, whatever, and you happen to see an oyster, you're not going to see what size pearls in there. It is not visible to the naked eye. And how many can, of us this morning can say the deepest work of God that he's done in my life is behind the scenes? It's not in the church or at a Bible study or at a retreat. The deepest work that God has done in my life has been when I'm alone. And I'm feeling lonely and unloved and it's just me there. And he's trying to work something into my heart and out of my life. It's a hidden work. And none of us like darkness. We don't want anything deep. And God's been healing me of deep issues, things that affect it. I only, here's, here's my thought on inner healing. Now, I don't, I don't know your doctrine on this, but if it affects your present and your future, it has to be dealt with. But we don't have to go back and dig up every awful, ungodly thing that we ever did or ever happened to us unless it's affecting our our ability to live for Jesus and to have hope for a future. But I've had things hidden that I didn't want anybody to know. And God has slowly and surely started to bring to light hidden things. I'm not saying sin that I'm practicing. I'm talking about hidden things in the past. It's a hidden work. And I'm going to tell you this because I feel like it. I don't normally share this one either, but here you go. I had a problem. I was saved and I have a wonderful husband, but I had a job work intended too, which meant he wasn't home when I got dressed for work, which meant I could buy a whole wardrobe and hide it from my husband. So I worked in a dress store. Can you imagine? So I had a dress for every day of the week. I had matching purses. I had matching shoes. I hid my clothes in my son's closet. I hid them out in the garage by the wood or heater. I had a rack in the car. My husband didn't have an, any idea I had all these hidden clothes. And so this one day I'm reading the Bible and I read about a guy named Gehazi uh, in Kings. He went after Naaman. I think it's 2 Kings 5. Naaman the leper gets healed and Gehazi runs after him and says, the prophet sent me to get some clothes. Anybody familiar with the story? Or it's a lie, you know. So he gets all the clothes and he hides them in his tent and he gets leprosy. And I read that verse and I'm thinking, oh my God, I got all these hidden clothes. I'll be a leper for life. There's not a colony big enough. And so I start sobbing and crying and, my, and I get all the clothes out. God says, get them all. Get them out of every closet. I hung them down the steps on the banister. I hung them in the kitchen. I hung them on the china cabinet. And my, I mean, I must have had, I don't want to exaggerate or elasticize. I'm going to say 30 dresses maybe that my husband didn't know about. Some of them had tagged, some of them didn't. He walks in the front door from work and I go, I'm a leper. <laughs> I have leprosy. Call me Gehazi. He said, what is wrong with you? I said, look. <laughs> so here's all these clothes, right? So he forgives me. Oh, it was a riot. He forgives me. And he says, now Gwen, here's what we're going to do. Anything you've worn, you can keep. But anything with the tags on it, I'd like you to take it back. So I did that. So fast forward with me. 15 years. I'm at Blue Mountain Christian Retreat. I preach there every summer and I'm preaching about Gehazi on purpose. I was doing Bible characters and I said, I told the story about how he used to have stuff hid and I said, I have nothing hidden from my husband. And then I went, well, I have one dress for Macy's. I said, but it's in the car. He'll never find it. My husband was watching live, live stream. So I get done preaching, and this is the text I get. Be sure your sin will find you out. I am on the way to Macy's returning this dress. God have mercy on your soul. <laughs> so I just want you to know, we can't get away with anything. The Bible said everything is open and naked before him to whom we give an account. So let God work in the dark. Let him work in the recesses of the places people don't see. Um, so a pearl's a hidden work. Uh, and the verse I used for that, a pearl being a hidden work, obviously Moses was hidden in the back of the desert. Joseph was hidden in prison. Paul was hidden. Josiah was hidden. Colossians 3, 3 said, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. So do you have the first couple points? A pearl is a product of suffering. A pearl is formed from junk and waste material. Number three, a pearl grows very slowly. Number four, a pearl is a hidden work. And number five, pearls can be very, very expensive. 
very expensive. Now, I have to really get off my duff and do something, but my mom's been dead for 35, almost 40 years, and I have a bag of pearls that were locked in her safe, wrapped in, um, uh, what's the word I want? Um, it's real soft to the touch, velvet. She has a whole bunch of pearls wrapped in velvet in a bag, and it was locked in the back of the safe when my mom passed away. And I've not done one thing with those pearls. They're sitting in some place in my house. I don't even know where they are. In a in a nice uh, bag, you know, they're at home resting in the in the velour, but they could be worth a lot of money. These are genuine real pearls. Did you hear recently? This is no joke. Did you hear about the guy that found a big pearl? It was on the internet um, three weeks, a month ago. A man discovered probably the world's largest pearl. And he put it under his bed. He's a fisherman. He put the pearl under his bed. He's headed there for years and years. I'm talking about this hidden thing. Um, and all of a sudden, his house burns down. And in a panic, he runs to get the pearl that's under the bed. Well, he brings it out. It hits the news media because the pearl weighed 75 pounds. And the last offer he got was $100 million to sell the pearl that was hidden in the dark under his bed. We have to realize we are very valuable to God. We are very valuable to God. You know, we take that scripture, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints, and we don't do that verse justice. Precious means God lost something of value. He lost his voice on the earth. He lost his hands. He lost the ability to hug and love. God uses people. So we are very costly to God. And the last thing, number six, pearl reflects light. The whole reason for a pearl is to reflect light. And you know, and I know, Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before men that they will see your light or your good works and glorify God on the day he returns. So my word this morning to you, in essence, is God is looking for some pearls. And he's already bought the field. The field is the world. He already owns the field. And so now he's looking as a good man to see if we'll give him time to use our mistakes for his honor. If he'll give us the opportunity to take all the time it takes to make us the way he wants us to make. And that even though we, we feel forgotten, some of us are hidden or at the floor of the ocean, and nobody sees us. God sees everything we do. And I think in heaven, we're going to be quite shocked at the people that are honored compared to the people that get the glory now. It's that little woman that scrubs the floor and prays for the pastor every day. You know what I mean? It's the man like my husband who would, who would be so bold as to write Jesus saves on his hard hat and have all the construction men laugh at him because he was a plumber. But when their wife left them, you know who they went to? They didn't go to the bar with their buddies. They went to my husband. Hey, Rev. They used to call him Rev. Can you, can I sit in your truck, Rev? My husband wouldn't eat lunch with the men because of all the foul jokes and demeaning to women that these construction men talked about. He'd sit every day alone in his truck reading the Psalms for years. And then one day God said, okay, Pearl, you've been there long enough and started bringing people to him. He got people saved, spirit filled. I mean, on construction sites at the casinos, God used him incredibly, but it was a hidden work. Nobody saw it when he sat in his truck by himself. How many of you know everybody needs to be needed? We all want people in our lives. So for him to be alone like that every single day, I give him credit because I might have, um, I wouldn't, uh, what's the word, I wouldn't give up my morals, but I might have compromised to be able to be with people and he, he couldn't do it. And God wants to use you. So let's pray. Father, I thank you this morning that we are pearls of great price. And Lord, it is, uh, it is that you have to let us go through sufferings to make us more like you. Lord, the testing and the trials of our faith and the suffering, make it fruitful. Bring it to a purpose, Lord, that we won't just suffer for suffering's sake, but we'll suffer to become more like you. Lord, I thank you that a pearl is a hidden work. And Lord, many of us don't see everything you're doing in our hearts and in our lives, but we want you to move in power. We want you to change us. We want you to deliver us. Father, even though it's a hidden work for those who feel like they're on the back burner, they have gifts, they have talents, they have anointings, and the doors of opportunity have not opened. I pray for them this morning in the name of Jesus that they will just
just stay faithful to the calling that no matter if we have to prepare for years, Jesus took 30 years for a three-year ministry. And so, Lord, I'm just asking for the men and women here that might be losing a little bit of heart because they're getting older and it hasn't happened the way they thought it would. But God, you're in control. We give you our lives today, God. We just want to thank you that even though it's a hidden work, you're working. And Lord, I thank you that you can use every mistake, everything that's ever happened in the past to turn it for the good. And so we just thank you, Lord, for all the men and women in the Bible who were just mess ups. Oh, chapter after chapter after chapter, because it gives us hope that if you can use a murderer and you can use a prostitute and you can use an alcoholic and you can use a man filled with anger and you can use a man who got his daughters with with child. You can use any of us. So I feel just to release this morning a spirit of hope. I thank you, Lord. The Bible says hope deferred makes the heart sick. But this morning we're receiving hope for our future, hope for our ministries, hope for our families in the name of Jesus. And we want to be pearls of great price. And all we really want, Lord, is to reflect the light of your love. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Just sit a minute. This message doesn't invoke much of an altar call, but I don't want to quench the Lord if there's anything he wants to do. And I, I think the only thing I'm really sensing to say is that don't let your past hold you back another day. If you haven't taken anything out of this message, you should be encouraged to know that if God can use those people, why can't he use you? Why can't he do something? He's looking really for the people that need him the most. He doesn't need the richest, the most famous, the healthiest, the most educated. He's looking for broken vessels. And if you had ever told me, I'm gonna, I don't want to keep on for time's sake, but I have never even been to a Bible college. I've been with speakers that so intimidated me. I didn't know what to do with myself because they had their masters and their bachelors and their doctorate and their theology and they wrote in Hebrew and they've been to Israel. And my paragraph would be, be Gwen Molly at housewife, mother of two. And then we'd get to the conference and the spirit of God would anoint me. And I'm so thankful for some reason for Acts 4, I think it's verse 13, it says, uh, they marveled. They said, these men are, and I'm not demeaning an education, please get all the information and, and education you can get. And how many of you know, I, I know the word a little bit. I spend some time with Jesus. And so the verse that did it for me was Acts 4. It says, it said, they marveled that they were unschooled and uneducated men, but they realized they had spent time with Jesus. Now listen, the best thing you can do is spend time with Jesus and let that pearl, let him polish that pearl and then you come out and you wear it proud and strong and the last thing I want to say is, the, and I didn't put this in my notes but it's really important, the pearl, you ready, is the only gem that cannot be divided. You try, to, you can split diamonds, emeralds, rubies. You take a pearl and you try to cut it and it shatters. We're all one body. We are all in the same field. We are all in the same oyster. We are all one pearl, whether we're white, black, young, old, Methodist, Pentecostal. It doesn't really matter. We reflect the light of God in our lives. Would you stand with me this morning? I'm going to dismiss, Pastor. Father, we just thank you for the word of God this morning. And we were hide this word in our heart. I pray for every one of us when men walk by a jewelry store or they're in a mall and they see a strand of pearls that we will remember that that's what you're making us. And you're going to put all these pearls in the same strand regardless of our denominations, regardless of our affiliations, because the blood of Jesus has made every one of us white and he has knit us together in one body. And so we just thank you for the word of God this morning morning. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. We hope you enjoyed today's message. If you would like to hear more, we encourage you to visit our website at regenerationchurchny.com. So if you're ever in the area, please stop by. We'd love to have you at our Regeneration Church Sunday service or our tender-hearted message. Again, we thank you for watching and may God richly bless you.